My psychiatrist thinks that I have some self-destructive tendencies. We tend to remember Jan Levinson where no one wants to be, at rock bottom. But the office's executive turned unhinged antagonist was introduced as a reasonable professional, a serious woman who did her best to manage Michael Scott, a task he doesn't make easy. Are you listening to me, Michael? Affirmative. What did I just say? You just said, let me uh, check my notes. Other office characters developed quirks as they were given more screen time, but with some notable exceptions, few became the sort of unlikable villain Jan was often made out to be. So what changed? In short, nothing did. The most consistent part of Jan's journey is Dunder Mifflin, a deceivingly hostile workplace that suffers from a serious misogyny problem. Part of my job is knowing how to talk to women. Let's be rational here. Like most of the unprofessional behavior in the show, the treatment of female employees is meant to reflect and criticize real office environments. So Jan's story is a kind of cautionary tale. She begins as someone competent and polished, maybe even aspirational. Why don't we go around the table and all say something that we know we're good at? I will start. I am good at public speaking. She then becomes unmotivated, toxic, and unstable. I'm just Everybody. not leaving. I'm not leaving. Not leaving. And her story illustrates exactly what long-term exposure to sexism can do. Michael, I'm not the enemy, okay? Dunder Mifflin is the enemy. Here's our take on how her toxic work conditions led to Jan's eventual downfall and why a supportive environment is crucial to any woman's success. My work has always been the thing that's gotten in the way of my happiness, so... <laughs> well... <laughs> If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. NordVPN is the world's fastest and most secure virtual private network. As a special offer to our viewers, click the link in the description below, nordvpn.com slash the take to get 68% off a two year plan. That's only $3.71 per month. And enter the code THE TAKE to get an extra month of NordVPN for free. Women today, though we have the same options as men, we often face a very different set of obstacles. Sexism can hurt women at every level. And as Jan's story reveals, this is true even for those in charge. All right, but you will let me run this meeting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Power trip. What? From underestimating female workers to resenting them for self-expression, workplace misogyny comes in many forms. What one person considers a harmless joke might be the breaking point for another. You are accused of making sexually suggestive remarks to Angela that made her feel uncomfortable. Dunder Mifflin Scranton Branch offers a good example of how female employees are forced to contend with constant, unwanted sexual attention. What? I'm just looking. Well, I remember why I dress the way I do at work. Jan also faces sexism unique to being a woman in management. Hey, is old uh, Godzilla coming in today? Um, I don't know. Women in positions of authority receive a specific kind of backlash for challenging the hierarchy that keeps men in power. As feminist author Bell Hooks writes, Patriarchy insists that males are inherently dominating and superior to everything and everyone deemed weak especially females. This system relies heavily on a pecking order, and having a woman in charge can feel like a threat. She's the worst. She's our boss. <laughs> she ain't my boss, dude. I don't work for that bitch. In Jan's case, men default to two stereotypes to discredit her. Because she's uptight and businesslike, she's an ice queen, without feelings. Jan is cold. If she was sitting across from you on a train and she wasn't moving, you might think she was dead. And because she's conventionally attractive, she needs to be put in her place through aggressive sexual commentary. Michael made that stupid movie. He doesn't get in any trouble. Maybe I should have slept with you too. These attitudes are thinly veiled methods of undermining authority she's not supposed to have. Nice to see you. Okay. At least not in a masculine business environment. I call her Hillary Rodham Clinton. Right, not to her face because, uh, well, not because I'm scared of her. 
Because Dunder Mifflin's corporate staff is primarily male, Jan is isolated in her position. One of the goals of these women's seminars is to feel out if there's any standouts, women who could be a valuable addition to our corporate life. The women at the Scranton branch at least have female peers to commiserate with, which gives them a united front. This memo that you distributed is insulting. Sleeves down to the wrists, button-up collars, and muted colors. Nobody dresses like that. Without a group of women on her own level, Jan has to deal with the challenges of being a female boss alone. And going against a system without any backup can be so fruitless that people often don't bother. No, All right, I'm not, this... I'm not, I just... I just don't know what to do anymore, Michael. Even Jan's efforts to promote other women to corporate usually end in gendered scrutiny from all sides. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. But apparently, judging from her outfit, Jan aspires to be a whore. Jan's interactions with her male peers are also strained by their tendency to exclude her. I never felt welcome there, you know? That's, uh... Such a Boys club. With a gender ratio that's disproportionately male, ensuring women feel included in corporate life is hard, and her co-workers often make it harder. Sports metaphors are one of the ways women feel left out of the language of the office. Between the conscious and unconscious attempts to make her feel left out, Jan is essentially an island at Dunder Mifflin, with no support from peers, fellow women, or the company. When my life fell apart and they, and they screwed me in New York and I felt like my whole world was collapsing around me, I didn't have anyone. Positive workplaces are characterized by open communication, employee empowerment, and general compassion. We reach our highest productivity and fulfillment when we feel secure. Women can't have fun if they don't feel safe. Since the foundation of the Human Resources Department, businesses have become increasingly interested in ensuring that workers feel seen and protected, not expendable. But to Michael, HR is simply a hindrance, a limitation on his own self-expression. There is no such thing as an appropriate joke. That's why it's a joke. Michael cares about his staff like a family, but paradoxically, he marginalizes the department designed to support them, which explains why his branch has so many issues. HR is a joke. I can't do anything about anything. This contempt isn't limited to Michael. Many higher-ups see HR as glorified behavior policing. We have this very irritating HR guy here. He's probably the only person you're not going to like. And this disempowerment lets inappropriate behavior go unchecked at Dunder Mifflin. Just my mom's coming in today? Mm, elf. Thanks, Kevin. Jan strives to rise above this, but the longer she works there, she sees the obvious double standards she's been forced to accept. She's expected to coddle Michael through every unprofessional mistake. Pam, I'd like you to keep a log of everything Michael does hour by hour so that we can analyze it at corporate. But she's punished when she starts to slip herself. Time has come for you to end your professional relationship with this company. You are clearly unstable. It's really no surprise that Jan couldn't survive without being more dysfunctional herself. Just let my assistant know if you're coming over so he can get more vodka, okay? Hunter, are you on? You got it, Jan. Office romances are nobody's business but the people involved. Romances? Getting romantically involved with a coworker always carries some risk. Bias and proximity make for a mess if things go south. It's caused a lot of unpleasantness between Dwight and Angela, who are both already prone to unpleasantness. But among all of the office's various couples, none demonstrate the true dangers of the workplace romance quite like Jan and Michael. Since Michael is defined by his unprofessionalism, he has no clue how to act when a romance develops with his supervisor. I'm sorry, no offense, but it's really sexy. <laughs> Please don't smell me, Michael. After their first drunken kiss, she makes it apparent, repeatedly, that she's not really interested. I would have to be a raving lunatic to try to talk to Jan about what happened between us. Her words, not mine. But Michael can't let it go. He ends up undermining Jan's authority by exaggerating their hookup to anyone who will listen. How can you like Jan? Maybe because she's my girlfriend. Was, or not my girlfriend. She's we hooked up. He shares intimate details that are meant to stroke his own self-image, while carelessly disregarding how they make her look. You took the ice clean? Uh, I don't buy it. Well, I'm looking at a photo right now, and I'm telling you, it could be in Maxim. 
other employees take this gossip as another reason to mock Jan, which makes her professional life feel increasingly futile. If Michael said he got to second base with you, does that mean you like closed a deal? Excuse me? Seeing it gets her nowhere, Jan eventually gives up on fighting her feelings. I still find myself wanting to be with you. Despite his boorishness, Michael seems genuinely affectionate toward her, and his track record of trying to defend her is somewhat endearing, though the execution isn't always perfect. She is a strong, soft, thoughtful, sexy woman. And you know what? I don't think I can sit here and let you talk about her that way. His earnest, albeit misguided, efforts in pursuing her make Jan feel more human and loved. You were there for me. By my side, without even a thought. Yet, as we see with Jan, deeper self-esteem problems can't be solved by dating someone who makes you feel better about yourself. I overcome my nausea, fall deeply in love, babies, normalcy, no more self-loathing. It's hard to believe that the emotional benefits of Michael's attachment could outweigh the intense embarrassment she gets from being near him. And her downward spiral seems to reflect that she's pinned too much hope on their relationship to fix her. Downside. I, uh, date Michael Scott publicly and collapse in on myself like a dying star. Jan gets objectively worse, both at work and in her personal life, eventually conflating the two. She treats Michael like she's his boss in every context, infusing the important boundary between their personal and professional lives. She likes videotaping us during sex. Oh my god. Oh, and then watching it back right afterward to improve my form. Her work identity hides her weaknesses, but it's also made it impossible for her to be vulnerable when she needs to be. I love you, Jim. Okay. Feeling superior to Michael just allows her to justify the way she treats him, which only ends up hurting them both. As her work life becomes more chaotic, Jan tries to regain control with unhealthy coping mechanisms. You smoke constantly in your office, you spend most of the day online shopping, you disappear for hours at a time, sometimes days. And eventually, Jan's inner turmoil translates into behaviors that shift her incompatibility with Michael into an extremely toxic situation. She was just crazy smart and really manipulative and I don't know. Some of the less ideal office pairings parallel Jan and Michael's problems. Kelly and Ryan, for example, are driven by drama and sexual tension. They reaffirm how a purely physical interest, like Jan's attraction to Michael, is not always a basis for emotional connection. Ryan, do you know when you would want to get married? Actually, I don't see ever getting married. Oh. Aaron's failed relationships with Andy and Gabe explore similar hazards of a workplace romance with uneven power dynamics. Thank God he's my boss, because I would not have said yes to a first date if I didn't have to. But not every office romance goes down in flames, and they can illustrate exactly what didn't work with Jan and Michael. A happy, healthy office romance. A perfect example, look at Jim and Pam. Through ups and downs, Jim and Pam's epically ordinary love story succeeds because of the respect they have for each other. Ever since Pam and I started dating, I just feel a little weird asking her to make copies for me. So, I make my own copies. They address feelings of low self-worth by pushing each other to be better, even when it's not the easiest thing to hear. You gotta take a chance on something sometime, Pam. I mean, do you wanna be a receptionist here, always? Oh, excuse me, I'm fine with my choices. Uh, Even when those insecurities threaten to overwhelm them, Jim and Pam have always been friends, which makes them want to put in the effort to save their relationship. I could have just had them fax it to me, I guess. <laughs> oh, I like you. Talk to you later. Michael's relationship with Holly after he lets go of Jan suggests that the best predictor of a lasting connection is having important things in common. A shared sense of humor, comparable values, or simple warmth and appreciation for one another offer a much more productive basis for love than loneliness, frustration, or proximity. It sounds like you're just wrong for each other. The impact of a negative environment is more than discomfort or decreased productivity. Regular exposure to toxicity normalizes it, which can permanently change your perception. By the time she's fired, Jan is undeniably a terrible employee and an all-around unpleasant person to be near. 
and she is one of the most erratic and terrifying people I have ever met. In some sense, she starts behaving like the male management around her, only putting in effort when she wants to, and being more lax about what constitutes sexual harassment. I'm spending okay. a fortune on gas and tools. I'll give you $200, and if I get up before you, I'll leave it on the dresser. Um, that... I don't know, that makes me kind of uncomfortable. Yet Jan's punishment is disproportionately severe, especially considering that her work environment plays a major role in getting her to that point. Don't sleep with your boss. Do you think this is referring to you boning Jan? From a productivity perspective, firing Jan was reasonable. Your behavior in the last two years has been completely erratic. Erratic? Recently, you don't even show an interest in your work. But analyzing the whole picture shows us that it's also unfair to blame her for becoming the person that Dunder Mifflin made her. Long after her termination, Jan still exhibits behaviors that can be connected to her time at the company. But Tom never had us use Bali. that. I am not Tom, I am Jan. We find two common themes in her post-Dunder Mifflin arc. First, she becomes a full-blown narcissist. Her arrogance can be a little off-putting. But it can also be seen as an understandably unhealthy response to those years suppressing herself at Dunder Mifflin in hopes of remaining ultra-professional. How do I do it? Raise my daughter, work as director of office purchasing for this hospital, and release an album of Doris Day covers on my own label? If I knew, I'd tell you. Jan's increasingly antagonistic behavior can also be seen as a grab for control after losing the authority she once had. Hi, can I help you? I need you to make me 100 copies of this on Canary Yellow. The shift from being identified with the status of her job to having no power at all, and then getting fired anyway, is detrimental to Jan's self-image. Clinging to her shallow relationship with Michael drags her down further still. This is what leads us to the unhinged Jan we most remember. This could be perfect. You know, my full-time job could be our relationship. I could wear stretch pants and wait for you to come home at 5.15. <laughs> her entire world is reduced to the confines of Michael's condo, where she exercises what little agency she has left. These walls, they used to be like white, like an asylum, so I wanted it to be softer, so I had it painted an eggshell white. Jan's efforts to regain control eventually become even more destructive. She spends Michael's money carelessly, leaving him bankrupt. You know, Jan has my credit cards and she's using them as if I'm made of money. She thinks I'm a human ATM machine. She treats other women with hostility over her unfounded jealousy. I heard that you were peeping on Michael. What? No, it was not. Look, I don't know what your deal is, but he's mine, okay? So hands off. And even after they separate, she tries to interfere in Michael's love life, still bossing him around. There is, uh, there is one more thing that you can do for me. Okay. Don't date Holly. Her interest in younger men, rather than being in spite of the uneven power dynamic, is deliberate. Jim and I are pretty sure she had an affair with her ex-assistant, Hunter. He was 17. It forestalls vulnerability and ensures that she remains superior. He's been growing that mustache for weeks. So young. Will you, uh, you, can you turn around for me, please? But taking advantage of those with less power isn't the solution to feeling powerless. Instead, Jan just absorbs that toxicity, ensuring she will perpetuate the same attitudes wherever she goes. Molly. I know it can't be easy working for Jan. Good luck with your feelings. Blaming harmful behavior like Jan's entirely on external factors oversimplifies things. In the worst situations, we still usually have some agency over what we choose to do. But without absolving her, we can recognize that many of the factors in Jan's downfall are reactions to what she's put through. Her actions grow more harmful during a highly vulnerable period of her life. In the last year, I've gone through a divorce, an identity theft, a husband who would not communicate. By the end of her arc, most of what Jan does is unacceptable, but there is also a distinct possibility she might not have turned out that way if she had at least been respected by the people around her. I sent you a memo about this. Yes, I know that, for I do read the memos. 
Instead, we see her suffer through environments she never really moves on from. She answers her termination with a lawsuit against Dunder Mifflin, which she pursues while risking her relationship with Michael. How could you give up my diary like that? I had to. I'm sorry, but I need to win this. We need to win this. By the end of the series, she's still seeking her revenge. Hey, thought it would be fun to have a little chat with uh, David Wallace after all these years. Oh, well. Ultimately, Jan shows us just how challenging it can be to ever get over a formatively bad experience. With the right support, her ambition might have taken her to the top. And they ended up turning the break session. room into a lactation room, okay. which is disgusting. Now so. you're really not allowed in well, this session. Well, I'm their boss, so I'm I feel your boss. like... Instead, her job took Jan right to rock bottom and left her cold, vindictive, and incapable of growth. Jan might be difficult to sympathize with, but she's a victim of her circumstances. She's a cautionary tale about what an unhealthy workplace can do to women. It's no wonder she's terrifying. I guess that makes me the devil! <laughs> you are! She is! She is the devil! Hi everyone, I'm Susanna. I'm Deborah, And we're the creators of The Take. Please subscribe and tell us what you want our take on next. This video is brought to you by NordVPN, the ultimate resource in internet security. Your internet experience is more important than ever as you work and play from home. With NordVPN, you'll gain access to all your favorite content available from streaming services in other regions. NordVPN servers are super fast, so you can stream HD content without lagging footage and receive unlimited bandwidth. And with just one account, you can connect as many as six devices simultaneously. As a special offer to our viewers, click the link in the description below, nordvpn.com slash the take, to get 68% off a two-year plan. It's completely risk-free. NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click now to pay only $3.71 per month and enter the code THETAKE to get an extra month of NordVPN for free.